Okay, now we've gone through my last Duchess and talked about the dramatic monologue and several details of the poem. But what's the purpose of the poem? What's the poem really about? First, the purpose of a dramatic monologue is to explore and reveal the psychology of a character, the speaker of the poem. Robert Browning was particularly interested in personalities that seem one way on the surface, but are something else beneath the surface. This Duke is a troubled guy, but we don't pick up on that right away because he is so well-spoken and calm and polite to the person he's speaking to. He shows his guest a painting, talks about how it came to be painted, what people like about it, etc. But Robert Browning's readers would have been more tuned in to the nuance of this nuances of this 19th century language than we are. They would have started picking up fairly early that there's something not quite right about this guy. She had a heart. How shall I say? too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whate'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Well, maybe she was a flirt. Maybe she was unfaithful to him. But as we read, I don't think we believe that. All he accuses her of is being nice. She's polite to people. She thanks them when they give her gifts. She enjoys the small things in life, like riding around the palace on a mule or looking at a sunset. His main beef seems to be that she is not impressed enough with him. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Well, I don't know about you, but at this point, I'm thinking this guy's got an ego that's run away with him. But lots of people have big egos. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're deranged. But as we go further, I begin to wonder. He won't even talk to her about his concerns, because even to talk about them would be a form of social stooping, coming down to somebody else's level. And he's not going to do that. I choose never to stoop. Well, now that is strange. You're so high and mighty that you can't even talk to your wife about a concern. And then we come to these curious lines. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. Hmm. Well, what were these commands? What exactly happened to this duchess? I think back to this concept of Marie Howes that we discussed in previous classes, the power of silences in a poem. The implications that lie between and behind the lines. This poem never tells us explicitly what happened to the Duchess, but the strong suggestion is that he killed her. We can assume she's not alive, because at the end of the poem we learn that he's negotiating to marry someone else, and this was not a world or a social structure in which people divorced. So, what starts out in this poem to be a reasoned, intelligent, socially pleasant speaker turns out to be a murderous egomaniac. A couple of details at the end reinforce that. Let's look at these lines. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. 
Now that's a little confusing to most students. A dowry is an old-fashioned concept. It's a sum of money given to the husband by the wife's family upon a marriage. Obviously, this is a custom that existed in societies where marriages were arranged. I know your master, the count, the father of the potential bride, is a generous guy. He is known for his munificence. That means generosity. So I know that he will agree to any dowry that I ask for. Hmm. Sounds to me like he may be interested in a tidy profit here. But then he says, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. In other words, I know your master will provide any dowry I ask for, but please understand I'm really only interested in the daughter. Well, after what he's told us about how he treated the previous duchess, I don't think we believe that. Now let's look at the last two and a half lines for a second. As they start down the stairs, the Duke points out a piece of art. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. It's a bronze piece of art showing Neptune taming a seahorse. Here's an image I found on the internet, which is sort of like what the Duke would be referring to, although you can't see as well as I would like. Neptune, the god of the sea, is usually depicted as a huge, powerful figure. A seahorse, if you've ever seen one, you know that it's a little tiny thing. So we've got this big bully Neptune lording it over this little tiny seahorse. And we can see why the Duke would like that piece of art. He would associate himself with Neptune and everyone else, especially his duchesses, with the seahorse. There's much more that we could say about this poem, but remember I told you in one of the early classes that all poetry in one way or another is about seeing, about seeing beneath the surface of things to the reality of things. And what this poem tries to do is take us beneath the surface of a disturbed personality, a personality that looks calm, reasoned, and civil on the surface, but is none of those things beneath the surface.